Uh, welcome everybody. Um, so we're going to be covering um, UK species, um, but this uh, webinar is hosted by the Saving Scotland's Amphibians and Reptiles uh, project. So we are, of course, very excited to look at, you know, volunteers across the UK and, of course, beyond, uh, looking at ways you can maybe get involved in your, your own countries. But for those of you who are lucky enough to also uh, be based in Scotland, just a little plug that we are um, quite a new project just started in October 21. Um, so we are uh, really looking for um, more um, volunteer surveyors uh, to get involved. So um, just to uh, introduce uh, my, the, myself and my colleague. So my name's uh, Rachel, I'm the Scotland coordinator for SAR. Um, and I work uh, with Janet Ullman. She's our education officer um, based in Loch Elsh. Um, and so the two of us um, make up the, the team, uh, the SAR team here based in Scotland. Um, and today I'm also joined by uh, John, who is our regional training and science program manager. So John leads on all of our training programs um, across the UK, but also um, uh, oversees our work in Scotland and, um, and in, in Wales. Hi, everybody. So uh, we're going to start off uh, the session um, with identifying reptiles. Um, and as I mentioned, there'll be an opportunity for some questions. Um, and then I'll be handing over to John, who is going to be taking us through the ID of amphibians. So in the UK, uh, we have three native lizard species um, and three snakes. But we'll also be touching on today a bit about non-native uh, reptiles and talking about why it's important for us to also record those. So of the six species um, we have, there's two that are very specialised and they have very specific habitat requirements, um, but also um, significantly threatened um, species that need um, some extra attention. So that is our sand lizard um, and our smooth snake. Um, but also the other four that occur in a range of different habitats, but also worth looking out for in farmland um, is we've got common lizard, slow worm, grass snake, and the fantastic adder. So we'll start off um, with a common lizards. Um, so they occur in a range of different habitat types. And as you can see from these pictures, you can get a really diverse range of colors. Um, so starting, um, from the left-hand side, you've kind of got uh, the sort of brown and green, but you also get this melanistic um, black coloration as well. Um, and you even get this really fantastic blue phase. Um, so, you know, it can be quite, you, sometimes people think you've got a different species, uh, but they are all the same species, um, but you can kind of see, uh, you know, the similar patterns. So it's actually the pattern that you're looking um, sort of uh, along these different um, color morphs. Um, and the common lizards can reach up to about 15 uh, to 16 centimeters in length. Um, and the picture here on your left hand side just gives you an uh, indication of the difference between the males and the females. So you can see that the male is a lot more speckled um, and um, than, than the females. And also the males um, have this sort of bulge at the base of their tail as well. So um, the males also have proportionately larger heads. Um, so again, you can kind of see in this, this picture here, uh, comparing the, the male and the female, um, shorter torsos, um, and but they do have a, a longer tail, um, which you can see this is you know quite significantly longer um, than than the female. Um, and this is a couple of pictures of some um, very heavily pregnant um, lizards. So, and again, you can kind of see uh, that they're quite a lot more stripy um, than the males. Um, and, you know, as kind of mentioned before, they've sort of, um, you know, quite smaller heads, uh, but they've got longer torso, but they do have that kind of shorter uh, tail than, than the males. And uh, this is actually a fantastic uh, photo taken by one of our, our colleagues. Um, but this is a, a sort of juvenile uh, common lizard. Um, so they tend to be born around sort of mid uh, July onwards. So depending on where you are based, um, the kind of the further north you get, um, the uh, the later in the season that will be. Um, again, you can get a variety of different colors. So kind of they quite range from sort of dark uh, coppery color, um, but they do have this, you know, quite a bit darker tail. 
um, and the colors change um, rapidly as the the lizard grows. But you know they are you know a very similar pattern um, to to the adults, um, and um, it will become gradually more obvious as they get older. And uh, this is then we're going to be looking at uh, sand lizards. So they have these kind of eye markings or ocelli, um, and um, they are quite a kind of key feature in their identification. So you can see from these three different pictures, although there's quite variation in the color um, and the, the sort of um, adult and juvenile stage, but you can really kind of see these sort of kind of eye markings really quite clearly. Um, and the picture in the top right hand side of the, the male has, you know, showing it's got a really broad head um, and the sides of them go actually quite green in the males during the breeding season. So really a very beautiful um, uh, kind of species. Um, and then the females also have, you know, the really bold kind of uh, uh, sort of the eye markings. So they really stand out quite significantly, as you can kind of see from, from these um, ocelli here. And um, the juveniles, again, um, you know, you can, they are really tiny, but very distinct um, sort of eye markings as, as well, as you can kind of see in this picture. Um, and then there is, the, this is a picture of uh, the June race. So this is the same species, um, but these are found in sort of Wales and North England, um, but they look you know, quite different. So it's just to kind of say, show that they're again, keeping us on our toes. They're not all, um, very clear cut. Um, so if you are in those areas, so the the um, the uh, sand lizard found in southern England are more common. This be the pictures that we'd shown before. Um, but this uh, sand uh, the the June race um, ones can look quite quite uh, different as well. So just worth keeping in mind. And then on to the slow worm. So um, slow worms are often um, misidentified as being snakes so they are actually a legless lizard and um, they are impossible to confuse with any of our UK lizards um, because all the others have legs um, but they are um, you know often mistaken um, often as grass snake um, so they have quite a defined head and neck region um, and sort of unlike other snakes they actually have eyelids um, and so they also like to keep us on our toes. Um, so you can have a whole range from sort of greys and browns to tan um, and sort of orange, copper, and also the melanistic or kind of black uh, variation as well. And the uh, an immature slow worm um, can kind of reach up to 40 to 45 centimetres um, or more in length. And these are a couple of pictures of, um, again, just different color variations in the males. Um, so um, they have proportionately, you know, kind of chunkier, they have proportionately larger heads um, and a thicker neck um, than the females. And um, the some of the males, as you can see in the picture on the right-hand side, actually have this lovely kind of um, uh, blue mottling. Um, so really quite distinctive um, spots. Um, and um, these can increase as they, they mature. Um, so again, the body variation can really vary as you can kind of see from sort of the sort of lighter brown and um, you can get to the kind of gray and also melanistic. And that's just kind of um, circling, you know, to have a look at the distinction between sort of the head and neck being actually, you know, really quite a bit chunkier. And in contrast, um, you can see these, these two pictures here of um, some females. Um, and they also, again, like to, you know, kind of keep us busy with trying to guess. They have lots of different colors um, as well. Um, but the females have actually quite distinctly, a, a, you know, a, a much darker coloration. Um, then on the dorsal part of the body is, is a lot lighter, um, as you can see quite clearly from here, kind of looking down, you can actually see the real contrast between that sort of tan color and then the darker brown. Um, and they have the stripe is along the full Kind of length of the body um, and also uh, the tail um, and uh, the females just in contrast to to that picture we had previously of the male you know kind of really quite chunky um, are a lot slender so you can kind of see the the neck in particular and the head um, is is all a lot um, smaller um, and the neck is much um, thinner than than the, the male. 
And also this is a couple of pictures of some juveniles. So, you know, again, really quite uh, pale in color, um, but you can really see even a much stronger contrast uh, between the tan and, and the brown colors. Um, so they're kind of quite a golden sort of a brown or can actually be grayish as well. Um, they can also be pink and a little bit reddish. <laughs> um, and then the sides, um, you know, can be kind of uh, brown or even black. Um, and they, they look much more similar to, to the females. Um, and um, uh, when they're uh, the sort of neonates, the kind of newborn, um, they can be, you know, kind of between sort of just seven uh, or to 10 centimeters, so really quite, quite small. And then uh, obviously the probably um, the one most of us would be familiar with is is hearing about the kind of amazing adder. So this species um, is really distinctive by this lovely little zigzag uh, pattern. So um, the males have a black zigzag um, and they're kind of often sort of uh, um, gray kind of background as you can see from, from the left hand side. Um, they're smaller than the females, so they kind of get up to about um, uh, 55 centimeters in length. And uh, the females, in contrast, are actually have a brown zigzag. Um, and so they um, can get up to about 70 centimeters um, in length and generally have a brown kind of so background as well. Um, but they, it can be a little bit confusing. And um, so these are wood, you would. Uh, be uh, you know kind of uh, easily forgiven if you thought that these were uh, females, but this is actually uh, uh, two pictures of two males, um, and so they can e very easily be confused because of the the sort of tan kind of background color. But just to go back um, again, so you know the females have this sort of the tan zigzag, um, and this is kind of a black zigzag um, or really dark brown zigzag. So. Um, that is, is the difference um, that you can kind of see. Um, also with adders, they have these little um, black spots or brown spots on the side um, of their body as well as the zigzag. Um, and so this is just, in, again, in contrast, showing you this is a female. Um, so I'll just flick back again. So this one here is the male, so much uh, darker um, zigzag, black zigzag. Um, but the brown body, and this one's a brown zigzag and a brown body. Um, and also, if any of you are ever lucky enough to see, here is a, a melanistic um, or a, a black adder, um, uh, and there's a lovely photo we have. And then um, just to show you some pictures of a juvenile adder as well. So they can look a lot, they are, look a lot uh, more similar to the female. Um, and they kind of can, you know, from about 14 centimeters up to about 40 centimeters, um, they'd still be, that's a kind of feature that you can, you know, tell that they are juveniles. They can't be sexed um, at that stage um, when they're kind of uh, juveniles or sub-adults. Um, but you can tell with all adders as well, um, it's worth noting that they have a, a kind of red um, eye, but they've got a vertical pupil, as you can see from, from this picture here. Um, and in contrast, this, the, this is the grass snake and they've got the round pupil. So it, that's a grass snake with a round pupil and then you've got the vertical pupil here. So again, it's quite nice sometimes when you can compare and we're quite lucky to have the pictures, but realize sometimes when you're in the field, you just get a quick you know, snapshot. Um, so then moving on to the grass snake. Um, so they are typically um, olive and green, um, but again, they can also be um, brown, or uh, grayish, um, so they can actually get up to a, a, a hundred uh, centimeters plus um, in length. Um, and as I mentioned, they've got this lovely kind of round uh, pupil as well. Um, and they tend to have this, um, well, they have this uh, yellow and black collar. And this gives you a better um, picture of that. So John always calls it his McDonald sign. And uh, so that's an easy way to remember the grass snake. So you can kind of see from, from this color. So uh, the males are a lot smaller 
um, and thinner uh, than, than the females. They also have quite a narrow head. And so you can kind of see, you know, if you're able to look from, from above, um, that their eyes are quite protruding, um, as you can see in this picture here, whereas the females have a kind of chunkier head and their eyes are, you know, kind of sit um, with, within, in, within the head and they don't actually protrude um, quite the same way. But you can also see that the females are a lot chunkier um, in their body um, as well. Um, and then this is a, a picture just to show you that these, uh, the grass snake is our only um, snake that lays eggs. Um, so this is a limiting factor to where they can spread and actually finding safe and uh, kind of warm areas to lay their eggs. Um, and this is a, a picture here on the left hand side is, is just showing you some eggs. So if you might also come across this, if you're lucky, they're kind of a lot more leathery um, looking um, you can find them on sort of those, you know, huge manure piles you sometimes see in farms, uh, in farms, um, but also compost heaps. Um, and um, then on the right hand side, this is just a picture of uh, juvenile grass snakes, um, and you can see that they're just the exact replica, tiny little replicas um, of of, uh, of of an adult. Um, we're not quite sure if grass snakes actually occur in Scotland. So there has been some historical records. We're not actually sure um, if some of them have been uh, relocated um, or misidentified. Uh, but certainly in the last 10 years, there hasn't been any verified record um, of any uh, grass snake occurring. We have had um, people get in touch who are you know, very experienced herpetologists who have seen them, but we don't have any evidence of any breeding. Um, so if you are out and about, especially in the southern part of uh, Scotland, um, it's just a plea to keep keep an eye out for them and do get in touch with us if you do come across any. Um, and then on to the smooth snake. Um, so the smooth snake um, has these kind of paired uh, sort of markings uh, along the body. So you can kind of see that's one of the, the sort of key features. Um, the males have this really orangey underside as well. Um, again, not always <laughs> something we're going to see, uh, but just uh, worth worth noting. Um, and then uh, a kind of key feature, really, if you're looking at the head, you can kind of see this like a, a bit of a heart shape on, on top of the head, uh, but they also have this uh, eye stripe, um, which you'll see more clearly in the next picture here. So as you can see from there, um, you know, that, that kind of nice eye stripe uh, going across, that's kind of quite a key feature there. Um, they are really seen above ground. Um, so, you know, this is a, a rare picture um, to see, um, but they they lack that zigzag shape of the adder. Um, and um, and again, the sort of the sort of eye stripe and the crown um, are the key kind of diagnostic features um, to, to kind of see. The, the identification feature, sorry, to, to identify those species. So then just a, a kind of whistle-stop tour on some of our kind of non-native um, species. So this is a couple of pictures of the, a wall lizard. So they get to about 20 centimetres in length um, and they have kind of longer uh, legs, which you can't really see so much in this picture, um, but also the toes, you can really see the long toes, and um, they're much longer than our native um, lizards. Um, and also they're, they're sort of patterning, um, they're quite mottled patterning um, along their flanks as well. Um, and they can be, they're usually kind of black and white kind of patterns um, along their, their sides. Um, and they're incredibly agile. Um, so the wall lizards, um, if you actually ever see them kind of running up an embankment, uh, sort of running up a wall um, in the UK, then these are going to be wall lizards. They can go, uh, you know, quite spectacularly kind of vertically up. Uh, they are native to Jersey um, and they are our commonest non-native reptile in the UK. Um, and then these are um, some pictures of the Western green lizard as well. So this is significantly bigger. This is also a native species to Jersey, um, but has had some non-native uh, populations introduced. So just if you're around the Bournemouth area, this is one to, to look out for. You might get confused. Um, and um, But yes, it's just found on the clifftops in Bournemouth. Um, there has been some escapees reported elsewhere, um, 
but so it's just one to, to look out for. Um, and um, the males can develop a distinctive kind of blue chin during the breeding season as well. Um, but they often have this sort of, um, as you can kind of uh, see just in this picture here, like a dorsal kind of uh, 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 stripe as well. And this is a picture of a juvenile and these are the, the adults. Um, and another thing that's really worth looking out for is um, sloughs or shedded skin. Um, so this is just to give a, sort of an a indication of, you know, like you can really kind of see the sand lizard um, sort of uh, markings here. Um, this is a grass snake skin and actually um, you can cut kind of the whole the whole body effectively uh, from the head right through. Um, and then this is just a picture of our three snakes um, and it's just a, a little plug and um, the the one in the middle is is the adder um, and you can kind of uh, see the zigzag pattern um, and so uh, this is just a, a nice picture here to show you kind of um, this uh, adder just shedding its skin so sometimes you will come across the skin kind of um, uh, on when you're walking about so we have got a project um, that we are looking to to get um, some genetic information from so if you do come across particularly adder sloughs we'd love to hear from you um, I'll pop this information in the chat and they'll also the slides will be available um, but if you could get in touch I mean it's great for incidental records as well to to have those records but also um, if you can pick up the, the skins and then uh, post them to us that would be fantastic and uh, that's all from me so I'm going to Pause for some questions, um, but otherwise I will hand you over to John. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that and hopefully, well, hopefully, hang on, all I need, there you go, it's working out. So we'll be talking about native frogs and toads also known as anurans i.e amphibians without tails of which there are four species in the uk and native newts which are tailed amphibians obviously with three species i'll mention eggs spawn and tadpoles too and then we'll talk a little bit about native amphibians so the commonest species most frequently in cave is the common frog they have smooth skins and are quite athletic. Um, jump or hop rather than walk. You won't see a frog walking, actually. Unlike popular misconceptions, they're not usually green. They're normally this yellowish brown colour. The KID features are their smooth skin, muscular back legs, and this dark eye is very indicative of uh, common frogs and their relatives. So there's... Um, an example of four different colour forms of the common frog. The ones like the one on the bottom left possibly are inbred, possibly have exposed to chemicals or something like that. But as you can see from all these pictures, um, they have a, a, an eye mask. The most common colour variation is really the one on the bottom right. Most frogs look like that across the UK. And Whereas once a time they used to be widespread in the countryside, since a lot of farmland ponds were lost, they tend these days to live in amenity or garden ponds, and they're very adaptable in the kind of ponds they can live in. If there are large fish in a pond, um, to uh, frog tadpoles are very, very tasty, so you don't tend to get them where there are large numbers of fish. But apart from that, they're quite variable in the kind of ponds that they use. On to the toad then, still called the common toad, but much less common than they formerly were. They're a much chunkier animal than the common frog. They have warty skin and don't tend to jump very much. They walk or hop. Particular ID feature is this lovely golden or orange eye and also the paratoid glands either side of the head. And these are things that if you're a predator, and you were trying to grab a toad and eat it, you would then get a very nasty taste in your mouth from these paratoid glands. And in fact, the warts also um, exude uh, nasty tasting substances as well. 
So toads live generally in different kind of ponds than frogs. They prefer much bigger, deep ponds, and they can tolerate fish because even their tadpoles taste nasty. Uh, so you'll find them often in very different kinds of ponds. If you get a medium-sized pond with some shallow areas, you might get both species, but very often they don't live in the same kinds of ponds, which is a, a useful thing uh, to inform pond creation projects, to be honest. If you want lots of different amphibians, put in lots of different kinds of ponds. Useful to mention the difference between males and females in frogs and toads. Um, I always say to people that male frogs and toads are like Popeye and female frogs and toads are like olive oil. They have tend to have weedy front arms, whereas ma male toads and frogs have these chunky forearms, especially um, muscular aspect of females during mating. Uh, and also in the breeding season in particular, they get these swollen areas on their thumbs and their fingers which also help them grasp the females and it's not so easy to see that in frogs but you can do that oh there you go so excuse me our next anurin is the natterjack it's our second rarest anurin really it's endangered in the uk it's right on the edge of its range it's mainly found on dunes or heaths also some salt marshes, places where they can burrow into the soil. <clears throat> they really like small temporary ponds that warm up quickly in the sun. And uh, as with the common toad, you can identify them through their eyes, which are greenish or yellowish. They also have, more often than not, a pale or um, yellowish along the back. And of course, there are different colours in common toads the warts tend to be greenish or reddish. Hopefully, uh, now we're going to hear, hear a natterjack calling. There are only native anure and have a large single vocal sac under their chin, and they can be very low. So when we tried that earlier, it didn't actually work, but hopefully you heard that. So as I say, they prefer these um, more temporary habitats. The breeding in ponds that dry up, they, they breed opportunistically when there's enough water in the ponds and the ponds are warm. They also need a different kind of terrestrial habitat than our other frogs and toads in that they absolutely need very, very open uh, vegetation height that's often heavily, heavily grazed. Um, I don't really know why, but certainly if the habitats they live in develop into woodland, you're more likely to get invasion by the other species and the natterjacks tend to move on or die out. So that's one of the reasons I'm afraid that they're as rare as they are. And our last one, which is... Uh, classified as critically endangered still, it's reintroduced into East Anglia. That's what we call the northern pool frog. There are pool frogs all over Europe, but many of them are, are bright green or variations thereof. Our pool frogs, in inverted commas, tend to be brown or yellowish with uh, also a stripe down their backs. They're also quite a noisy species, but unlike the natterjack, they have uh, two vocal sacs, one either side of the head. The male is slightly smaller, uh, and they're only found in uh, Scandinavia, Estonia, and England. Um, it's because of when the English Channel was forming, um, southern England was cut off from France long before it was cut off from northern Europe. So our um, pearl frogs are related to those from Sweden, for example. In fact, that's where they've been reintroduced from. They need these really unusual post-glacial um, pingo habitats, um, which were caused by uh, ground being frosted and then collapsing when the, when the ice melted. So you can see there that we use cattle to actually maintain those habitats, keep them open and make sure the ponds don't 
become full of scrub, etc. Um, they also need nearby woodland, however, to hibernate. <clears throat> so frog and toad spawn, hopefully everybody already knows this. Frog spawns always in clumps, toad spawns always in strings. That's common frog spawn on the left and toad spawn on the right. Natterjack spawn looks very similar to common toad spawn, but once it's been laid and swells up, the eggs divide into a single string, whereas toad spawn, common toad spawn, the eggs will divide into a double string of eggs. So you can always tell those apart unless they're um, heavily uh, tight around something, in which case they're stretched, but something to bear in mind, you can usually tell them apart. Similarly, the tadpoles are very, very different. When they hatch, they're small black and tadpole surprise, surprise, but as they grow, um, they're easier to tell apart. So the frog on the left and the toad on the right are actually at very similar stage of development in this picture. Um, frogs, tadpoles tend to be speckled and they hide. They tend to behave a lot more differently to toad tadpoles because, as I said earlier, they are extremely tasty, whereas toad tadpoles are not. They're a bit more distasteful, so they're quite happy to swim around in the open. <clears throat> Excuse me. And unlike newts, frogs and toads will develop their back legs before they grow their front ones. If anybody has a good theory as to why newt tadpoles develop front legs first, uh, I'd be lovely to hear it. So, um, you can also tell the species apart when they first leave the water. So these are both animals that have just recently left their ponds. They're known as metamorphs. You can already see the features that you'd see in the adults. So um, more athletic back legs and a pointy nose in the frog and a little snub nose and uh, a more, uh, an inclination to walk in the toad. And you can see tiny paratoid glands on the toad if you look very carefully. Um, all baby toads are really, really tiny when they leave the water. Um, whereas frogs can be a bit bigger if, they, uh, if they've eaten more. And lastly, our non-native frogs and toads include the marsh frog, which is a relative of the pool frog. Um, they're extremely variable in colour. It's the most, our most common non-native and boron. Marsh frogs are found um, everywhere in sort of Kent and Sussex uh, and lots of other places around the UK. And there are related species which look very similar as well. So it's uh, difficult to go into the ID features of all of them, but um, you can see they look very, very different to the common frog. And also, of course, they do tend to be more green than either the common frog or the northern pool frog. Then there's the midwife toad, which is found in 10 or 15 different locations around the UK, including as far north as Whitby, probably the most north northern midwife toad populations in Europe. Uh, they do live over the channel, so they do very happily in this country. Um, they're not really a toad, but they do have eggs in strings. However, the males wrap eggs around their back legs and uh, sit somewhere damp until they're ready to hatch when they go out and find a pond and the tadpoles hatch and swim away. Unlike other native species, we don't believe that midwife toads are causing any problems. Uh, touch wood and I hope that remains that way too but we like to monitor them anyway just to make sure the last one I'll mention is the American bullfrog um, this was established in the UK in two or three locations mainly in the south there have been efforts to eradicate it and I very much hope they've been successful because this is pretty much a nightmare they, they grow large enough to eat uh, small waterfowl, actually, and pretty much everything else, including other amphibians that would naturally be in the ponds where they were introduced. So hopefully we've seen the back of those. Worthwhile showing you a picture just in case you do spot one, and we'd love to know if you do. <clears throat> so on to the newts now. We start by comparing the males. So this is a palmate newt. Uh, they're, they are variable in colour, but they're basically brown or olive coloured with spots on their 
flanks and especially two rows of spots along their tails very often. They will grow as big as nine centimetres, but they can breed at much smaller size than that. Uh, rather than having a crest like other male newts, they just have a low ridge and they're very boxy in section. But for palmate newts, <clears throat> you can tell um, they're a male by their tail filament and also by these heavily webbed hind feet that look a bit like sycamore leaves. <clears throat> a closely related species is the smooth newt. They can grow slightly bigger than palmates. But of course, uh, what I always say is smooth newts have a smooth crest. So they have this unbroken wavy crest along their back. Um, and unlike the palmate with its uh, heavily webbed feet, their feet are just frilly. Both species can have a stripy head, but it's often more easy to see in smooth newts. Oh, yes. And of course, um, we'll see in the great crested newt shortly that um, males can have flashes of colour on their tails, which is a, one of the ways they attract females. In the smooth newt, there's a blue and orange flash at the bottom end of the tail. So you'll see the contrast in a second. Female newts can be hard to tell apart. The females of smooth and palmate newts look very similar. However, if you are doing a survey, uh, and you get the opportunity to hold them and flip them over, you can see that their undersides look very different. So female, well, and male, smooth newts are spotty, and palmates are pink or plain. So smooth spotty, palmate pink and plain. Uh, very few or no spots on the underside of a palmate newt female, but more importantly, the throat is the place to look because there's no pigment in it. You can see the blood vessels if you've got one in your hand, uh, and that's why they're pink. So you'll sometimes get a female smooth newt with no spots on its throat, but it will have pigment in there. So it'll be this pale cream colour that you can see on the left there, even if it's got no spots. If it's translucent and pink, then it's a palmate. And that's probably the most difficult ID feature that you'll ever encounter with reptiles and amphibians in the UK. So the great crested newt then is the largest species. Um, they can grow 15 centimetres, sometimes even a little bit more, much darker in colour uh, than, than the other two species. And the males have, rather than a smooth crest, they have a very jagged crest. And the other thing that you get with great crested newts is that there's a break between the crest on the tail and the crest on the back of the body. You can see here as well, as I mentioned earlier, they also have a flash on their tails, uh, which is white or bluish, but in the middle of the tail rather than at the lower end. Um, they have lovely black and white, black and white, black and yellow stripy feet, by the way, which aren't, isn't that easy to see in this picture, but you'll have to trust me. Females actually look very similar, grow slightly larger, but lack the crest, and that's the main difference between them. This is a nice picture of um, a great crested new female showing you why the alternative name for the species is the warty newt because they are very rough skinned, a bit like a toad, and they do have these white stippled warts on the sides of their body. Um, female great crested newts also have a, often have a yellowish stripe at the bottom of their tail. And irrespective of sex, their undersides look nothing like either of the other two native species a very bright, often yellowish or orange coloration with irregular, very prominent spots that often merge into one another to make, well, almost like a stripe, I suppose. And you can see what I mean by that picture, actually. Um, each one is completely individual, and you can use this in studies to identify individual great crested newts to count the population, for example. Oh. Um, newt eggs, of course, are not laid in clumps or strings. They lay them singly. Female newts can take several weeks to lay their um, 
quota of eggs, should we say, um, each one individually wrapped in a leaf, um, held together by the feet of the female. Sometimes they even chew around the edge of the leaf to make sure it's sealed up properly. And these will be mostly uh, just under the surface of the water on leaves of plants with a sufficient size for them to be able to do it. Uh, if you're surveying in an area where you think there might be great Christian newts, you're going to need a license to do it because they're highly protected. However, you can tell the eggs of great Christian newts apart from the other species, particularly because although the size is often difficult to see in the field, they're yellow or whitish in colour, whereas those of the smooth or palmate newt are greyish or brownish, uh, and you can't tell the smooth and palmate newt eggs apart, unfortunately. The tadpoles or larvae are also distinctive. Great Christian newt larvae have a number of characteristics, including large axolotl style gills that face forward and outwards, a broad and spotty tail fin, and a golden iris. But they also behave, they swim around in the water column uh, and dangle their toes, uh, as the one in the picture is doing. So they're very, very vulnerable to predation by fish. So this is why great Christian newts are as protected as they are, or one of the reasons they are, because actually they're very, very vulnerable to being eaten by fish when they're tadpoles. In contrast, tadpoles of smooth and palmate newts behave a bit like common frog tadpoles. They're much more sensible. They'll skulk in the bottom of the pond amongst the vegetation or in the mud. Slightly less uh, prominent gills and really um, muddy speckling on the tail rather than the big obvious spots of the great crested new larva. And finally, uh, let's talk about some non-natives. Our most common non-native newt really is getting very common now with probably 60 or 70 different places in the UK that you can find them, from Edinburgh to Cornwall uh, and also in Ireland now as well. They grow slightly larger than smooth or palmate newts, but not as big as the great crested. A key identification feature is the blue coloration, uh, but also yellow or orange on the side, which tends to be plain without spots. They sometimes have spots on their chin area, but that varies depending on where the animals come from. We've got alpine newts from all over Europe present in the UK at the moment. <clears throat> Uh, males have uh, a small dorsal crest, which is black and white, and uh, black and white spotting on their side as well. In the breeding season, uh, and it doesn't necessarily show up particularly well in this photo, but they do go very, very blue in colour, and they can't really be mistaken for anything else. So this is uh, an animal to watch out for. They They will become more common, I'm sure, and spread around a little bit more, something that, something else that we're actually uh, trying to monitor at the moment. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, also in the breeding season, the underside coloration of the male becomes more vivid, which is something I nearly forgot. It's a good job I had an arrow on my slide. So I think probably the last uh, ID slide is a tadpole, larva, and newt. They look in shape, very similar to a great crested newt larva, but they tend to be much, much darker. So if you do pull one of these out, take a picture of it and send it to us and we'll try and identify it for you and create a new record of alpine newts. So a little bit about surveying and recording. Um, we've got online introductions to survey sessions coming up next week. Uh, look out for others and any field survey sessions around the UK that we're going to be running will be advertised on our events page and you can sign up and find out more about joining our survey and monitoring schemes also on the website on our monitoring pages. There's some happy people doing a pond dipping session. So if you're in Scotland and you want your school or community group to get involved in that sort of thing, adopting a pond. We've got a program called Champhibians that my colleague Janet runs. Please do contact her. And lastly, thanks for listening.